Can you hear it ringing, Heather? Oh, I did hear something. That's perfect. Then we could. Oh, that we sounds really morning. Good morning. Is that uh, Mr. Jeremy Black? It is, and I'm ready to go. Oh, you're live on the Good Morning Portugal show, Jeremy. How are you this morning? I'm fine, thank you. And I'm imagining it's warmer in Portugal than it is here. Um, I'm yes, I can't tell a lie. It is. It's it's lovely here uh, to, to, this morning. You are in my home city, or I have lived in Exeter and had many uh, wonderful years in Devon and Exeter. How is Exeter this morning? Exeter's fine. I mean, it's the part of England that I, I suppose is closest to. Portugal in the sense that it actually has white Italianate style Mediterranean style buildings and a bit of sun but it doesn't have weather as good and the food isn't as good as in Portugal. Oh you sound like a fan. Now uh, Jeremy I was wondering Heather's here as well she may may chip in with a question. Um, you are a history guy um, possibly more than you're a Portugal guy. Is that correct? You know, your expertise is in the world of That's history. correct. I've written, the reason you've got me on is because I've written a brief history of Portugal, um, published by Robinson, and it's part of a series I did of those countries I liked. So I've also done ones of Italy and Spain, though I prefer Portugal to Spain, and of France, and of Germany, and of the Med, and I've got one, and of the Atlantic, actually, and Portugal shows up in the Portuguese world, you know, Brazil, Angola, shows up in the one of the Atlantic. And what I've tried to do is to do with so few, hist you know, I'm a proper historian, I was professor of history first at Durham, and then at Exeter, and I've written lots of heavyweight books on subjects like military history, and so on. Yes. But I also try and write, unusually, accessible books. So the one on Portugal is a book without footnotes. It's designed to be read for relaxation. And it says underneath it at the bottom, indispensable for travelers. Well, it's designed to tell travelers to Portugal about the history of the country. But also, in a way, it provides a history written by an outsider, which is useful. Because as you know, in Portugal, the history is very politicized. Oh, yeah. People's views on Salazar or anti-Salazar, people's views for the 19th century on the radicals or the non-radicals, so on and so forth. And what is useful is to stand back a bit and to try and produce a nation history in a broader context and to try and explain why there are different points of view. It's not much help to say this point of view is right or that point of view is wrong because that doesn't help you because lots of people won't agree. Yeah. It's more important to look why there are different points of view and why there's different public memorialization of the past. Absolutely brilliant. And uh, I'm so glad I'm not calling you from Sp Spain or France, as it turns out. You clearly like Portugal uh, specifically. Um, and you have written a brilliant guide here for people who are considering coming here uh, to live or, or to travel. It's such a good primer. It starts in the Stone Age, doesn't it? And then brings us up to almost a couple of decades ago. Yeah, no, it brings us up actually to the present. I mean, um, because, well, in a way, all of us are interested in the future, but the past is the only, as it were, data set. But also the past leaves its mark across Portugal. You've got everything there from prehistoric remains, which can be visited, as I discuss in the book, uh, Romans, quite extensive Roman stuff. You've got um, a little bit of Visigothic, that's the post-Roman Christians. Then you've got the Islamic imprint. Then you've got the reconquest. Uh, and then you've got the successive ages of building architecture and history. And it's worth bearing in mind that from the late 16th century, Portugal was the first of the great world empires. Now, there were other world empires like China or ancient Rome, which ruled large contiguous areas. But the Portuguese, of course, were a transoceanic empire. And, you know, by... Um, 1560, when obviously things started to go pear-shaped, and in 1580, the Spaniards took over, or Philip II of Spain became Philip I of Portugal. But prior to that, the Portuguese had established an imperial presence around Africa, in Brazil, uh, in India, uh, in the, what is now Indonesia, and they had trading links into um, China at Macau and into um, Japan at Nagasaki. And this was quite astonishing. Um, 
Now, the Portuguese then had this rather dire period. You know, King Sebastian stupidly invaded Morocco in 1578, got himself involved in a civil war there. Uh, he gets killed. His army gets destroyed. The Portuguese succession, as it were, runs out. And the Spaniards take over. And there's this period from 1580 to 1640, which again is a period which it's difficult to get people to accept that there are contrasting views on. But in 1640, the, you know, the Spanish Spaniards, then it's Philip IV, gets kicked out, Philip IV of Spain, that is, get kicked out, War of Independence, and from then on, Portugal is an independent country. Okay. And has a fascinating history as, you know, this world empire. And the world empire really continues. I mean, obviously, in the 19th century, the largest colony of all, Brazil, is lost at the same time as Spain lo loses its mainland Latin American colonies. But even thereafter, Portugal, till the 1970s, remains one of the, you know, European uh, imperial powers. And these days, you know, people are expected to apologize, et cetera, et cetera. But that's totally ahistorical. It would have meant absolutely nothing to the Portuguese of the age. And I'm not sure it's very helpful to be ahistorical. As I used to say to my students, you know, people in 300 years' time, maybe 100 years' time, might regard us all as war criminals for eating meat. But it doesn't help. I eat meat, I ought to tell you. But that doesn't help <laughs> judging the 20th century or the early 21st century. You need to judge societies on their own terms in order to understand them as opposed to preach to them. Well said. Well said. Thank you. Could, could listen to you all day, Jeremy. Um, it's great to have you here. I want to talk to you specifically about some of the things you love about Portugal, you know, as, as a person, as, as a visitor. I wanted to ask you first, though, um, at, at the beginning, and I forgot to do this, how many books have you actually written? Oh, I've got the world record for the number of history books written. It's about 185. It's a what? crime to trees. What? <laughs> no, you can look me up on Wikipedia. But uh, by the way, I'm not the Jeremy Black who's a pornographic star in America. So just... <laughs> okay, goodbye. We talk about you. We're not interested in talking to you anymore. We're just... No, 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 yeah, absolutely. I can fully understand. <laughs> but I was, I was once sent, I was really amused by this. I was once sent an article, this man gave an interview in which it said, and I loved this, Jeremy is also a thinker. And I loved that one. <laughs> Um, but no, that's not me, unfortunately. I might have had a more interesting life. Um, <laughs> certainly one that would have been better seen. Um, but, um, yes. No, yeah, I mean, I started off, um, I was an undergraduate, undergraduate at Cambridge, postgraduate at Oxford, went to Durham in 1980 and taught there from 80 to 2015, eventually as professor. Then I went to Exeter, which was warmer. Mm -hmm. and taught there till I retired just at the beginning of 2020. And I'm still writing books at the present moment. I'm writing, in fact, Ooh. a transport history of Britain at the moment. Um, but, you know, it keeps me off the streets and also means I enjoy giving podcasts. And there's loads of free podcasts on my website. You can look at my website. There's loads and loads and loads of free podcasts on all sorts of historical topics. I'm currently doing a series on geopolitics, for example. We the history yeah. What, what is your website? I can't remember what it's bloody well called. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you don't don't expect me. I can me. find it. I can find it. To know my own mobile. I don't know my own mobile. No, fair I I mean, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry for all the silly <laughs> questions. Yeah, but don't don't worry. No, what? don't worry. What do I like about Portugal? I think the people are very relaxed. I like the fact that in contrast to Spain, it's got more trees. It's got, um, it's not got a bleached out feel to it. I, I like the food, which I think is amazing. I like the way in which most of the cities are very compact and you can easily walk around them. I like the fact that the Portuguese like the British, which, you, you know, is very pleasant um, and is, is relatively unusual these <laughs> days, one has to say, in it the world. True. I like the fact that you can fly to uh, Porto and Lisbon and get on public transport and get into the city centre. I think there's all sorts of things that are very... But now, obviously, I'm not a fool. 
I know it has a contentious internal politics like we do in Britain. Yes. But, you know, I know that there are issues. I know people are concerned about the price of property, you know, in, in Porto and in Lisbon. I'm well aware of all of those. I'm not a fool. But it's uh, as a place to visit, it has an enormous number of attractions. It does. And your favourite food or wine, Jeremy? My fa- I like the wine, the you know the Alberino wines. I oh, like yes. those. I like ginger, you know, with yeah, the, yeah. the cherry stones in. Yes, in. Yes. Um, I like e. I like eels. Actually, I've had lovely eels in wonderful sauces in Portugal, and eels, which used to be quite big in Britain, um, you know, nowadays you don't get much eel, and it always comes in the same congealed mess in Britain. Um, I like the, the, the Portuguese fish, though I don't particularly like salted cod. Um, I like pork, and I think the way that the Portuguese do their pork is very good. I'm not so wild keen on their beef. Um, I like, you know, I mean, there's lots and lots of good things in Portuguese food. Uh, it's been so- I love tomatoes spread on bread, uh, you know, for breakfast. <laughs> That's something I do in Britain. I take a slice of sourdough bread and push, you know, some squash and tomatoes on it. Okay, um, I'll be trying I like that. that. Like, you know. <laughs> yeah, we get great tomatoes here. We were eating tomatoes. Oh my God! Uh, have you got a question for Heather? Bobby O'Reilly's joining us on the screen as well. You can guess where he's from, uh, Jeremy. But uh, Bobby, good morning to you, Heather. Do you have any questions? For good Jeremy? morning. He probably has to go and write another book. Uh, I'm just going to say I didn't expect him to be so funny. And he reminds me of Robin Leach from Lifestyles, The Rich and Famous. Okay, His there you voice. go, Jeremy. I don't know if you've had that comparison before. Good morning to you, Bobby. Do you have a question? No, I haven't. No. I think, look, can I just say, I think you've got to be try and laugh because otherwise one should be crying all the time, you know? Right. Well, <laughs> yes, you have some pretty I'll intense be, I'll topics. Be this, I'll be 68 later this month. And quite That's frankly, the knee, you know, when I get up in the morning, the knees and the joints sound like a symphony orchestra going off, all the, you know, <laughs> creaks and things. So, so you've just got to try and be positive. And one of the reasons I write books, also is to keep my mind alert. What I find is so depressing about old people is, okay, they're like me, their body's going crap, but their minds, they become old farts, particularly the men. The only conversation they have is, you know, whatever they're repeating from the Telegraph or the Guardian or, you know, some boring talk about somebody snubbing them at a golf club and who the hell cares. And what they need to do is get their minds engaged. And one of the great things about reading is it keeps, and you know, it's great to read, including if you think what the person reading or giving a lecture on is wrong. Yeah. That's great. I mean, I gave three lectures at Gibraltar last month, which was great fun. I lectured on James Bond and I lectured on geopolitics in Ge- Gibraltar. And what wow. they, you know, I happened to think the lectures were pretty good. But I wouldn't mind if somebody came out of them and said there are three things he's got wrong because it shows their brain has been fired up. That's Aww. the key thing. Um, and you see too many people have got a, a, you know, a brain like plasticine and they're not, you know, they're not creating new thoughts. They're not reacting sensibly. They're not reacting themselves. They're just taking it in passively as if they were a baby. And that's just ridiculous. Well said. Um, so no, I enjoy doing that. It keeps my mind alert. I mean, you know, at two o'clock, I've got to do a, um, a uh, podcast for the New Books Network in the States on uh, how I, as a military historian, you know, see the war, the new war just started in the Middle East. So that's fascinating. So I'll have to answer their questions and think it through. And that's fascinating. That's good for me. Um, You know, doing the James Bond talks in Gibraltar, I gave two on those. And that was, again, great. You know, James Bond politics, how the novels fit in, how they changed to the, you know, I've written a couple of books on Fleming, mm-hmm. uh, how the novels fitted into the uh, the changing world, which is then depicted in the films. It's fascinating. It's interesting. interesting. And the questions from the audience, sometimes you don't know the answers. That's Jer- great. Jeremy, it makes that- you think. It makes you go away and think. Love everything you've said. Darren does too. He said he's popping to the shop to get some tomatoes now. Now, there is, there is is a Portugal um, connection with James Bond, and perhaps we can, uh, you know, uh, he spent time at Estoril, of course. Yes. Estoril was um, Lisbon as itself um, was a great listening station during the war because it was neutral. And the point is, there were other neutral places, obviously Stockholm, for example, and Zurich and Bern in Switzerland. But the problem with these Swedish and Swiss listening stations, neutral powers, is very difficult to get to them. Uh, 
you know, for the Allies, you know, to get to Switzerland, you had to cross Axis territory, for example. But the point about Lisbon is that German and Italian agents could readily get there across Spain. British and American agents could readily fly in. Uh, and there were loads of emigres and refugees there as well. So it was one of the major listening stations. So there was a big adfair station there, German military, in, sorry, German yeah, military intelligence. There was a big Italian military intelligence one. And the British were also there in spades. And what, what you get there for is an enormous interest in traffic that comes comes out of Lisbon because there's the possibility of picking up rumors, picking up even real news, which you've, you know, acquired listening to people or trying to get them drunk at casinos and such like. And for the British, it was very useful as a listening station. And that's the reason Fleming was there. Also, of course, um, you know, Lisbon was a way in which you could fly, not with complete safety. There was always the danger of a long range German air interceptor taking off from Brittany, but you could fly with reasonable safety to Lisbon and then fly on from Lisbon um, to the Caribbean, to South America, down the west coast of Africa, oh, and as it were, that. reach out into the wider world. So it was very important as a transit station for the Brits as well. We would love to get you here. Um, Bobby, who's tuned in as well, you won't be able to see who's on the screen here, but Bobby's with us, Heather's with us, and uh, our, our uh, audience are enraptured listening to you. Well, I'm Jeremy. always happy to go to places, to give talks, as long as people pay my fare and look after me. We I got... like to be like a parcel, wrapped wrapped up and nicely <laughs> unwrapped at the other end. Do you know what? We should think about that and get you But also as a porn star, I'm afraid I don't want to disillusion you. Well, yeah, that's, that's the problem with you saying just look me up on the internet. Um, we've actually got your, your website address. It's jeremyblackhistorian.wordpress.com, not jeremyblackpornographyactor.com. Um, be careful with your search history when it comes to this man. Bobby and I do The Englishman, The Irishman, and this weekend, two Brummies walk into a bar. Perhaps, Jeremy, we, what do you think, Bobby? An Englishman, an yeah. Irishman, a historian walk into a bar. Should we get Jeremy over? I think it'd be brilliant, to be honest, yeah. OK, so uh, that, I, I think that's an invitation from us to Good Morning Portugal. Uh, Hell, Dad, De Mayo, your home, Dynasty Homes here to bring you over and, uh, and, and record a conversation with you, Jeremy. You've been amazing this morning. Thank you so much for your time. Great pleasure. And I hope, listen, uh, look, listen, look, listeners, you don't have to buy my books. You ought to be able to get them in libraries. But they are designed for you. They're not designed for other academics. They reflect academic knowledge but it's designed to be made accessible and too few people are doing that the other thing is too many bloody books are too long i can't stand long books. <laughs> <laughs> comes in 42 pages and neither none of the pages are too big they're all the same size what a surprise oh, get, it, get, it, get it on audiobook get it on audiobook and listen yeah, to it but you see for example the latest jk rowling cameron stride one mm -hmm. you know is a thousand pages long. I mean, you drop it from the first floor of your house, you're going to kill somebody on ground level. Just <laughs> <laughs> yes, writing books of that length. Anyway, my friends, right. you look after yourselves, Jake, have me. a drink, and I hope to meet you. Cheers, Bye, Bye, Cheers. Ciao, ciao. Bye for Cheers. Now. Ciao. Bye. Thank you. What a legend. <laughs> okay, if you bring him over, I can put him up in the Airbnb downstairs. Because he's, he's that, that guy's funny. <laughs> He didn't is. expect that. I didn't. I mean, you could hear me moaning, couldn't you? Like Michael Herons dropped me right in it here. The blo blokes can't. I can't do Zoom. I can't do Teams. I can't. You got You know. And then we get him on the phone, and he's an absolute legend there, Bobby. How are you this morning? Good. Good. I actually enjoyed very much listening to him as well. Yeah. Really, really, good. really sharp. Really, yeah. and really knows his insights. And uh, um, I didn't know actually you squeezed the tomatoes on on the bread over here. I know I do it in Spain. I haven't seen it in Portugal. <laughs> well, it's a great survey. One of many things that he, that many takeaways that we can enjoy from the interview with him this morning. That was great. Let's get him back um, yeah. and chat with him. I mean, you can imagine, can't you? I mean, this is this is what uh, twenty to ten in the morning. Can you imagine what he's like after a few beers or glasses of wine? It'll be, 